Right, uh, welcome everyone to what I think I'm going to call the Lockdown Art and Arts and Society Forum. We never thought when we started uh, somewhat experimentally last spring that by this spring we would have become something of an international institution on Zoom. Um, having organised a number of events about the arts over the past year, um, which brings has brought us a much wider audience than we had in our um, kind of London-based forum. My name is Wendy Earl, and I'm convener of this forum, which is associated with the Academy of Ideas, and like the Academy of Ideas, committed to organising open discussion, in this case, about the arts. And the, our, our discussions are rooted particularly in a somewhat unfashionable notion of the of arts for art's sake. And in this spirit, we're looking, we are holding a series of lectures on what makes art work, focusing on different art forms in turn. If you want to check out what we've already covered, you can find links to recordings on the Academy of Ideas YouTube channel and on our Facebook page. And my technically proficient co-host, who is managing um, the uh, technical side of things, Rob Lyons, will post links in the chat. So the next event in mid-April uh, returns to the focus of visual arts, which is one of the dominant themes of our, our discussions, and will be led by Dido Powell, who um, leads London Gallery Art Tours. But today we're going to focus on poetry. Jo Nutt will talk about a number of his favourite poems, and then there will be a chance for you to comment, query and challenge him, and offer your own thoughts about poetry and the poems you love or hate. But before we get started, I want to first to invite you to join the Academy of Ideas. The Academy of Ideas is an organization run on a shoestring and it punches way above its weight. Throughout the lockdown, the Academy of Ideas team and their associates like myself have organized numerous free events. It needs your support to keep up the good work, not least in order to organize the next Battle of Ideas Festival when hopefully lockdown will be over in the autumn and which we so desperately need for open discussion. The Academy is committed to creating a public space where ideas can be contested without restraint. And if you like what we do, you might consider joining as an associate to support the work. Benefits include discounted tickets to all battles of, uh, Battle of Ideas festivals and related events. And also you get regular bulletins with articles, podcasts and video debates. And occasionally there's even a special offer. So Rob will post a link uh, on chat about how you can join or donate, um, and I hope you can. So back to poetry. Most of us have a very ambivalent relationship with poetry. We may have studied it in school and we may have dabbled even in writing it as teenagers. We may have scraps of favourite poems popping up into our heads at odd moments but it's really part of our lives in any real way, which is strange when you think about how, as po uh, when you think about it, because poetry is such, uh, it's about language and language is indispensable to our very existence. And we take a lot of pleasure in language often. So Joan Nutt's book, The Point of Poetry, published in 2019, and what caused me to invite him to do this talk, provides some fascinating and useful reminders of why we might benefit from paying a bit more attention to the poetry and to particular poems. Jo taught English for 20 years and has written books on John Donne, uh, has books on John Donne, uh, Shakespeare and Milton, and so he's well qualified to get us engaged with the art form again. He'll talk for about 45 minutes and then it's over to you. I'll explain a bit more about using the raise hands button when I open up the discussion. In the meantime, you could in the meantime, you can post questions and points in chat and enjoy listening to the talk. So, Joe, over to you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Wendy. Right. Well, hi, everyone. And lovely to see you, if not in person, uh, <clears throat> which would, after this grotesque period of domestic internment, be, I'm sure, an even greater delight. Now, I'm going to speak for a while about poetry and I'm going to read you a few poems I've chosen for various reasons I'll explain as we go on. But please don't think of this as a lecture or even, even as a presentation. So many of the best words you'll hear from me this evening <coughs> aren't mine anyway. 
but I hope you'll find what I do have to say is an invitation to ask questions of your own and to discuss all things poetic once I'm done. Now, a couple of years ago, I was invited to speak at a leading boys school. It was a national poet, it was National Poetry Day and I arrived a few minutes early. So I took the opportunity <coughs> to sit in, excuse me, sit in the car park for a few minutes and listen to the Today programme. Right on cue, they had a feature about poetry, during which the poet Nikita Gill said exactly this. All poetry is political. Even poems about flowers are political. A statement of such laughable nonsense, I fully expected a lively discussion to follow. Uh, but no, no less than Simon Armitage, the Poet Laureate, and BBC's Michelle Hussain agreed enthusiastically. Now, if you read the blurb on the Academy website for this event, you may have noticed this short series of questions. I'm just gonna slip to a, a slide very quickly. So these are the three questions. What is it about our culture and society that finds poetry difficult, even embarrassing? How do contemporary poets themselves contribute to this situation? What is wrong with the way poetry is introduced in school, which causes people to turn their backs on it? So that little anecdote about visiting the school, I think alone goes a long way to answering those first two questions. The third, what is wrong with the way poetry is introduced in school? I'll run my shins up against briefly later. Now, when poetry is so widely sold to the public by poets themselves, as nothing more inspiring than literary politics, as wordy activism, is it any surprise the poetry shelves in Waterstones are so dusty? In the next few minutes, I hope, just by reading a few and inviting you to enjoy them, to demonstrate beyond question why such a view is so unhelpful, why reducing poetry to politics is an insult to the men and women over many centuries who've taken the English language and turned it into astoundingly beautiful and significant art. And why today, instead of being studied and valued as the most significant thing human beings can do with language, poetry is largely ignored or even worse, paraded like some spoilt overdressed child by its overindulgent parents to perform in front of their grown up guests outside the White House. One very successful US poet who the TLS described as amongst the most topographically responsive of modern American poets and whose poetry has been translated into French, Dutch, Bengali, Finnish, Czech and Portuguese. As far as I know, without anyone insisting his translators were doppelgangers, recently tweeted this. He said, 99% of poetry is the reason why most people hate poetry. There's no life in it, no light, no music. And when it gets published, trees weep. Now, let's start by looking for life and music a few centuries back. I'm going to read you only part, because it's very long, of an old English ballad called Tom O'Bedlam's Song, which I think Harold Bloom once described as the most magnificent anonymous poem in the language. It dates from around 1620. And if I can share my screen with you, you can read it, you can read it too. From the hag and hungry goblin that into rags would rend ye, the spirit that stands by the naked man in the book of moons defend you. That of your five sound senses, you never be forsaken, nor wander from yourselves with Tom abroad to beg your bacon. While I do sing any food, any feeding, feeding, drink or clothing, Come, dame or maid, be not afraid, poor Tom will injure nothing. Of thirty bare years have I, twice twenty been enraged, and of forty been, three times fifteen, endurance soundly caged. On the lords of, lofts, of lordly lofts of bedlam, with stubble soft and dainty, brave bracelets strong, sweet whips ding-dong, with wholesome hunger plenty. And now I sing any food, any feeding, feeding, drink or clothing. Come dame or maid, be not afraid. Poor Tom will injure nothing. With a thought I took for maudlin and a cruise of cockle pottage, with a thing thus tall, sky bless you all, I befell into this dotage. I slept not since the conquest, till then I never waked, till the roguish boy of love where I lay found me found and stripped me naked. 
while I do sing any food, any feeding, feeding, drink or clothing, come dame or maid, be not afraid, poor Tom will injure nothing. When I have short, have shorn my sow's face and swigged my horny barrel, in an oaken inn I pound my skin as a suit of gilt apparel. The moon's my constant mistress and the lovely owl my marrow. The flaming drake and the night crow make me music to my sorrow. While I do sing, any food, any feeding, feeding, drink or clothing, come dame or maid, be not afraid. Poor Tom will injure nothing. Now I find it a really, a really wonderful thought to think that when Edgar in King Lear fakes madness and wanders the heath with a fool and a lunatic king, chuntering Tom's a cold repeatedly, you hear in this poem the precise echoes of what Shakespeare's audience must have heard. When I teach poetry, I tell students, first of all, to look carefully at the poem on the page, to take in its physical shape. Over the years, I found that while students so often struggle to hear the music in a poem, they can just as often see it. Tom Bedlam's song is remarkable in this respect. In line after line in the poem, you can see its wonderful music printed in front of you, not as musical notes, but as repeated sounds. Besides the obvious powerful rhymes like barrel and apparel or pottage and dotage, the poem's riddled with echoing sounds, lovely, owl, marrow, sorrow, crow, book, moons, short shorn, in skin, suit and gilt. This acute sense of how individual words sound is woven into the flow of the line itself. Listen again to these few lines and just relish what happens when you make music with words. Of 30 bare years have I twice 20 been enraged and of 40 been three times 15 endurance soundly caged. Now you are of course entirely free to read the poem as some kind of political commentary on medieval poverty. But I think you'd be spectacularly missing the point. It would be like going to an American diner, buying a Knickerbocker glory and only eating the wafer. Or as John Dunn might have said, a woeful delight. Now, the next poem I'm going to read is, for me at least, just extraordinary. There are big, important poems I reread for pure pleasure. The Rime of the Ancient Mariner, Paradise Lost, Venus and Adonis, The Prelude. But when it comes to short, standalone lyrics, John Donne's Twickenham Garden reminds me of a story that's frequently told about the football manager, Brian Clough. Asked about how good he thought he was as a manager, he replied in that distinctive whining Midlands voice of his, well, I wouldn't say I was the best manager in the world, but I was in the top one, that's how I feel about this poem. This is Twickenham Garden by John Dunn. Blasted with sighs and surrounded with tears, hither I come to seek the spring, and at mine eyes and at mine ears receive such balms as else cure everything. But O oh self traitor, I do bring the spider love, which transubstantiates all, and can convert manna to gall, and that this place may thoroughly be thought true paradise, I have the serpent wrought. To a wholesomer for me that winter did benight the glory of this place, and that a grave frost did forbid these trees to laugh and mock me to my face. But that I may not this disgrace endure, nor yet leave loving, love let me some senseless piece of this place be, make me a mandrake so I may grow here, or of stone fountain, weeping out my year. Hither with crystal vials, lovers come, and take my tears, which are love's wine, and try your mistress' tears at home, for all are false that taste not just like mine. Alas, hearts do not in eyes shine, nor can you more judge woman's thoughts by tears than by her shadow what she wears. O perverse sex, where none is true but she, who's therefore true, because her truth kills me. Now, I can't imagine how many times I've read and taught this poem, 
Dunn would like that. Hyperbole was just one of his many gifts. When I was preparing this talk, I went back to reread things I'd written about this poem before, but the sheer depth of what's possible to say about it, the wealth of intellectual stimulation it provides anyone willing to think, it, it's almost obscene. In one book I wrote, if ever you feel in need of a perfect poem, this is it. 27 lines of staggeringly clever verse, as detailed and skillfully constructed as a Fabergé egg. So I gave up on the idea of even trying to cherry pick from it. It's simply impossible here to explore what a talent like Duns can do with the idea of a conceit or his courageous toying with sex and religion, which is literally breathtaking since get it wrong at the time and there were a number of even more vital things they would remove on the scaffold before they finally and mercifully got to your breath. If there is one thing I admire above all else about Dunn's poetry, it's his courage, a quality in desperately short supply today when our literary culture feels characterized by puritanical scorn, self-pity and timidity. I'm not gonna dwell on his managing to slip that dangerous five-syllabled religious bombshell transubstantiates into a line as though it was the easiest thing in the world or the smiling wit lying behind choices like whole summer and disgrace. Instead, I'm just gonna say this, I've studied many poets and their work. And in this new English dark age of self-censorship characterized by often foolish, timid notions like offense and hate crime, only possible by instilling in people a kind of widespread linguistic fear, reading work as brilliantly vital and courageous as Dunn's is the perfect antidote. Now, my next choice of poem is by another religious schizophrenic, William Blake. <clears throat> this is his deceptively childish cradle song. And again, let's see if I can quickly share. Sleep, sleep, beauty bright, dreaming in the joys of night. Sleep, sleep, in thy sleep, little sorrows sit and weep. Sweet babe, in thy face, soft desires I can trace secret joys and secret smiles, little pretty infant wiles. As thy softest limbs I feel, smiles as of the morning steal, o'er thy cheek and o'er thy breast, where thy little heart doth rest. Oh, the cunning wiles that creep in thy little heart asleep. When thy little heart doth wake, then the dreadful night shall break. The thing about Blake that I love is something I think he shares surprisingly with Thomas Hardy. Both are deceptively simplistic poets. Uh, I think John Carey described Hardy's poetry as the art of appearing artless. And I think that suits the early Blake too. His poetry reads, well, like poetry should, or at least how less experienced readers think it should. The rhyming couplets here are irresistible. The repetition, fitting the lullaby, lulls you, into thinking you know exactly what you're dealing with, only for the poem's beatific maternal smile to suddenly transform into a sardonic leer in that final verse. Nothing is, is ever really simple in Blake's verse. Rhymes take on something larger than themselves. Certain rhyming words become locked together where the, the sum is greater than the two parts. Smiles and wiles, weep and sleep, Blake's verse is not for the complacent. Now, driving through a series of country lanes a few years ago in the early summer, on my way to, believe it or not, the third weakest primary school in the country, a fairly remote village school right on the south coast, I listened to an episode of Desert Island Discs, which featured the record producer, Robin Miller. Miller's choice of music and his justification for each track was absolutely enthralling. I can't recommend it enough because he's so clearly a man who really knows how to listen. He is, by the way, blind. One of his choices was the opening to the track Gimme Shelter by the Rolling Stones. And if I can sort this out, let's just listen to that little bit now. Don't tell me about this and why you've chosen this particular track. Gimme Shelter has 
the best 45 second intro of any rock record ever made beautiful guitar riff with a vibrato on the guitar giving it a sort of shiver and then the producer jimmy miller plays a little south american fishbone with a stick then a couple of notes on the piano from nicky hopkins a second guitar thing a little strange haunting harmonica from mick jagger and then charlie watts black black boom Perfectly timed riff from Keith and then Mick Jagger comes in screaming his head off and they mix it way back in the mix and the producer says I think we should get a woman to sing on the chorus and it was the end of the 60s and it's a it, it's a incredible piece of apocalyptic music but more than anything else if you don't want to play air rhythm guitar and be Keith Richard when you're playing this, you, there's no hope for you. I think Miller's, you know, absolutely right. It is just extraordinary to listen to that. And I think people find listening to music much easier. And that's why it's one reason why I quite like to use it to make them think about listening to poetry. But if, when you listen to Edward Thomas's poem, Adelstrop, now, which I, the next poem I'm going to read, if you still don't get why listening to poetry matters, then like Miller said, you know, there's no hope for you. So here's Adelstrop. Yes, I remember Adelstrop, the name, because one afternoon of heat, the express train drew up there unwantedly. It was late June, the steam hissed, someone cleared his throat. No one left and no one came on the bare platform. What I saw was Adelstrop, only the name and willows willow herb and grass and meadow sweet and haycocks dry, no whit less still and lonely fair than the high cloudlets in the sky. And for that minute a blackbird sang close by, and round him mistier father and father, all the birds of Oxfordshire and Gloucestershire. Now the reason I chose this poem is not just because it's so famous and famously English, but because it embodies that crucial idea that great poets are music musicians with words, the whole thing is a brilliant game played with sounds. The delightfully English, English pronunciation of that name, Adelstrop, someone clearing their throat, the hissing steam engine, the blackbird singing, and that marvellous relishing of the sounds produced when all you do is bounce two counties off against one another of Oxfordshire and Gloucestershire. When you love poetry, <coughs> reading Adelstrop aloud feels like downing a full glass of vintage champagne. Now I'll turn now to one of the precursors of champagne socialism, Christina Rossetti for the next poem. I love the enigmatic quality of her work, the way she teases and provokes you. I think she's one of the first great English poets who felt entirely comfortable with uncertainty. I mean, imagine a dinner table conversation between her with Blake and Milton. I think I know who would have smiled the most. So this is a song by Christina Rossetti. When I am dead, my dearest, sing no sad songs for me. Plant thou no roses at my head, nor shady cypress tree. Be the green grass above me with showers and dewdrops wet. And if thou wilt, remember. And if thou wilt, forget. 
I shall not see the shadows. I shall not feel the rain. I shall not hear the nightingale sing on as if in pain and dreaming through the twilight that doth not rise nor set. Haply I may remember and haply. Now I could spend an awful, an awfully long time talking about the detail in this slight little poem because it's so rewarding to do so. But I'll just mention the first line and the last two. There are only two strong words in that brief first line, when I am dead, my dearest. They're strong because of the hard D sound they begin with, the stress that naturally falls on that first syllables, because it's quickly repeated, and because you can actually see the same pattern at the start of those words, dead and dearest. Add to that, that idea that the second syllable of dearest, rest, is synonymous with death, and the word my is orally, almost a perfect reversal of I am. And you begin to appreciate just how condensed, intense and skillful Rossetti's verse is. <coughs> Excuse me, the ending provides another wonderful example of that skill. In the last two lines, happily may I, may, I may remember and happily may forget. She rubs our face in the ambiguity like a custard pie. Happily is an archaic word that carries the sense of perhaps, but read, even with perfect enunciation, it's impossible not to hear happily simultaneously. Now that really is clever. Now, the next poem I've chosen is even shorter, although far less ambiguous when it comes to death. Randall Jarrell's The Death of the Ball Turret Gunner is a deeply disturbing little, little lament. From my mother's sleep, I fell into the state and I hunched in its belly till my wet fur froze. Six miles from earth, loosed from its dream of life, I woke to black flack and the nightmare fighters. When I died, they washed me out of the turret with a hose. J.C. Levinson wrote in the Virginia Quarterly Review that the death of the ball turret gunner establishes the matter of factness of flack and fight more successfully than it establishes its big generalization about airmen and boys as creatures of the state. I disagree. Jarrell was too old to fight in World War II, but trained Air Force navigators. I think one of the most powerful but least understood aspects of poetry is how often readers respond to it on a deeply personal level. I don't think fiction or drama work, even at their best, in quite the same deeply personal way. Nelson Mandela survived decades of imprisonment with the help of what many today would, re would regard as a, a little scrap of maudlin Victoriana, Invictus. It's commonplace for people to talk about particular poems they love or reread, or poems they read because they associate them with particular memories, people or events. We study poetry from you know, feminist and psychological perspectives. Why not the unashamedly personal? Perhaps there's an equally valuable critical approach to, to pursue just by writing about how verse relates to the individual lived experiences of its readers. My father was the perfect age for fighting. He joined the Household Cavalry in 1939 and left on December the 12th, 1945 after fighting in Italy, the Middle East and North Africa. Like most soldiers with battlefield experience, he rarely ever talked about it. But occasionally when I was very small and he was busy gardening, which was his passion, he would tell me a story or two. Like the time he had to run for cover in the North African desert as a dive bomber attacked his troop, he ran uphill, his boots slipping madly in the loose sand and flung himself under an overhanging rock and then had to watch as the shells from the plane skipped towards him through the sand. Thankfully, the last few thudded into the rocks above him. He spent much of the war in armored cars as a radio operator. And the only other story that I recall explains why I find this poem so poignant. One absurdly hot afternoon in Italy, he told me how he had spent hours listening on the radio to the local US Air Force base where one after another, the huge B-17 bombers, ironically called flying fortresses, were coming into land after a daytime bombing raid. 
he said it had upset him terribly because from every single plane all afternoon the conversation would go something like this coming into land five dead two wounded coming into land three dead four wounded etc etc for hours these 17s flew with 10 crew all the time he said he was thinking how many of them were were younger than him just boys really just creatures of the state now i'm going to be deliberately provocative here and take us back to those two earlier questions what is it about our culture and society that finds poetry difficult even embarrassing how do contemporary poets themselves contribute to this situation now, I think one of these things has been the rise of performance poetry. There's no reason whatsoever that just because you wrote a great poem, you can also read it. I shudder at the mere idea of listening to Byron read She Walks in Beauty. Can you imagine Shelley reading stanzas written in dejection near Naples or Keats reading Lamia? I think it might be because I've been unduly influenced by hearing that amazing early recording on a wax cylinder of Tennyson reading The Charge of the Light Brigade, like Jacob Marley's ghost in The Muppet Christmas Carol. But ever since I first stepped cautiously into some smoky darkened room above some obscure London pub about 40 years ago, to hear someone perform their own poetry, I've struggled. To be fair, I've heard some lovely performances, Wendy Cope, for example, and Andrew Motion, but it's far more common to hear contemporary poets adopt this bizarre, painfully unnatural kind of faux gravitas, a kind of weird lilting monotone, oozing sincerity that sounds like a bit like this and forces pauses into the language where naturally there are none. It's become de rigueur in advertising that features poetry where the sanctimoniousness is just excruciating. There is also a definite clique thing a whiff of superiority that lingers amongst poets, a deliberate effort to distance and raise themselves above the common man, which the common man, unsurprisingly, doesn't like. Coleridge and Wordsworth knew all about it, hence the lyrical ballads. I've toyed with the idea of writing a book about it, but always feel overwhelmed at the sheer scale of the task. So having said all that, I should really completely forfeit any right to read any performance poet's work but I'm gonna try anyway. This is honestly a real experiment because in the written version of this particular poem, I got permission to use in my book. There are only three question marks and three full stops in the entire poem. And although at one point there are some opening speech marks, they never close. So it's very difficult to distinguish reported from direct speech. Added to that, uh, the recorded performances I've heard by the poet are not the same. And there are half a dozen additional words in lines in the written version that don't appear in her recordings. So this, this could be fun. I'm going to read it in exactly the same way I would read any poem for a class of students, using my own voice with the aim of doing the poet's voice justice. Although to make it easier for me to read aloud, I have punctuated the poem. I'm not going to attempt to mimic her reading because I think all poems should be transferable. So this is my version of Holly McNish's famous for what. I asked my class what everyone wanted to be and a lot of them told me a celebrity in magazines, in television, on football fields or worldwide singing. We went round the class with everyone giving an answer. Then I asked her, what do you want to be? What would be your dream job? She said she was going to be famous, miss, and everybody scoffed. She doesn't talk a lot, you see, just sits and licks her lips, her lip gloss and lessons. She said, shut up, she's going to become famous, and everybody laughed again. I turned around and asked her, for what then? She looked shocked and didn't understand. I said, I'd like to hear your plans and how you'll get that life then. I repeated what I said, I said. I said famous for what? then, because I hear young people say this all the time. They say it more and more. She twitched a bit and bit her lip and looked down at the floor. She said she just meant really famous, rich, and didn't really know what for. Well, bigger boobs and big brother, that's all been done to death, I said. 
A few are famous families who get them in ahead, actors, sports and music stars. They all work very hard, I said. People who are famous are not all just the same. She said her best friend kissed a footballer, now everybody knows her name. I said, my best friend saved a life today and no one knows her face. Loads of folks are photographed for their clothes or who they kiss at night, but some are really famous for more than how they show their life. Famous TV chefs, she says. I smile and say, that's right, but there are famous people all around you might not know from sight. People who write your favorite stories, but don't glory in the limelight. Many people you'd think look boring, I think you should look twice because some are famous for inventing things you use or new discoveries, famous for the places they have seen and been uncovering. Some are famous for the people or the countries that they help. Other folks are famous for the products that you buy, they sell. Some people are famous for their songs or books or magazines, not those in the photo spots, but the ones who write behind the scenes. Some people are famous for drawing beautifully and adding things. She said she wished she had shaped lips that kissed like Kim Kardashian. I said, me too, they're really nice, but that would not change anything. She said she cannot sing. I said to her, so what? There are so many other things you could be famous for. She said she doesn't see those people. How would she ever choose? I said, think about the things that really mean a lot to you, the things that make you happier, the things you love to use, the rules you might not like, or the laws that all affect you. She said she hates her school and the subjects that she's taking. I said, then go become a famous minister of education because someone is in charge of your school, your hospital, your food, your money. Someone decides on all the stuff you have to learn and study. What age you have to be to do things you want to do and play. People make up all the rules you have to follow every day. What medicines you use when ill or how much your work will pay. Decide if you might go to war one day or how to lower violence rates, how many playgrounds we should build, how many plants or grass or trees. And none of these people are YouTube hit celebrities, but the effect they have upon your life is huge, your friends, your families. All I'm saying is not everyone that does stuff is in magazines and there are so many options and you could do much more. And if you still want to be famous, just remember to find out what for. I could have attempted mimicry I could have tried to read the verse with the kind of breathless, impulsive lilt McNish herself uses throughout. But to do that, you have to ignore the natural shape and the sound of the words. I've thought very hard about this because McNish is far from the only one to do this. It's become a conventional way of reading that performance poets have widely adopted, I suspect, without themselves really knowing why. This is the best way I can describe it. The technique is to ride over the natural rhythm of individual words, ignoring what conventional poetry calls metre, while imposing a rhythm, all of your own, for one reason only, so that you can deliver the rhyme. It's difficult to do, and I can only imagine the poets themselves use some form of additional notation to indicate where they intend to put the stresses because if you simply follow the natural flow of the words, as I did when I read it, the rhymes become very hit and miss. It's the difference between, if I can do it, <coughs> she said she wished she had shaped lips that kissed like Kim Kardashian. I said, me too, they're really nice, but that would not change anything. And McNish's version, which goes more like this, she said she wished she had shaped lips that kissed like Kim Kardashian. I said, me too, they're really nice, but that would not change anything. Now, my final poem is again a contemporary poem. And I've chosen it firstly because it's beautiful. And secondly, because it comes with some rather lovely visual imagery and music, which I thought would be a nice way to round this off. I'm only gonna show you a minute or so uh, as, and this is a deliberate encouragement for you to go and watch the whole thing yourselves afterwards. It's by the Shetland-born poet, musician and filmmaker, Roseanne Watt. Uh, she's won a number of awards, including the Edwin Morgan Poetry Award, and her collection of poems, Murder Die, won both the Edwin Gregory Award and the Somerset Maugham Award last year. To be entirely fair, 
I think like Randall Jarrell's poem, one reason I like this is deeply personal. I'd never been to Shetland, but as a young man, I was lucky enough to spend a lot of time in the Orkney Islands. It's a gorgeous, beautifully wild landscape that just thrums with history, whether it's the astounding Neolithic settlement at Skara Bray or the Viking runes scribbled on the wall inside Macehow Cairn just outside Stromness. There's such a lot in Roseanne's verse that resonates with me. This is just a flavour of her film poem, Between Islands. I'll stop it there and encourage you all to go and enjoy Roseanne's poetry or by Moda Dye if you, if you enjoyed that. Now, earlier, I promised you I'd address that third question. What is wrong with the way poetry is introduced in school, which causes people to turn their backs on it? Now, I don't think I'm alone in thinking that schools have been selling poetry short for years. Yet I'm never impressed by the routine response to this issue that comes from the poetry community, and especially the space where that community interacts with schools and teachers. With monotonous regularity, they whine about children being forced to analyze poetry or grammar teaching and set these two up as impassable barriers to something they love to call creativity, but which in practice is more often than not literary anarchy. They seem to regard poetry as synonymous with self-expression. In primary school, that's often the written equivalent of drawing with crayons. In secondary, it manifests itself as junior activism, the kind of politics Blue Peter might approve of. I remember attending an English examiner's training event when I was still teaching, in which the lead examiner of the biggest examination board in the country showed a number of examples of pupils' creative writing at GCSE. That is, that is of course, age 16. These examples were almost completely unintelligible due to a combination of weak handwriting, even weaker spelling and a fundamental lack of sentencing rules. But she devoted the entire training session to showing everyone how to in effect guess at what the child might have been trying to write in order to award the marks. Now, I think that anecdote provides a flavor of why schools do such a bad job of handling poetry. Engineering fairness or chasing that mythical beast equity is never teaching. For me, the single most damaging thing schools do with, do with poetry is they perpetuate the crude lie that I began my talk with, that even poems about flowers are political. While preparing this session, I saw an English teacher tweet a request for recommendations for war poetry to read with her year sevens, that is children aged 11. I wish I could say that was unusual, but it is anything but. My reply was, honestly, I would never teach your war poetry to year seven. They are children, let them be children. And it was gratifying to see that my reply received nine likes, but then the person who suggested Dulce et decorum est got 22. So, Thank you very much for listening and I will be delighted to discuss this question or indeed anything else you'd like to raise now. We've lots of time to enjoy your thoughts and views 
And if after listening to me, you now feel compelled to follow me on Twitter, that would be nice too. And you can find my username easily just by Googling me. So thank you very much. Right, Joe, thank you very much. That was a real tour de force. And I think that the way you combined um, both being it, introducing us to the poems and reading them and also throwing in a few political barbs on your way was um, very stimulating. So I'm, I'm hoping people will have lots of points and questions and challenges. I personally kind of quite liked uh, Holly McNeish when I was reading her through and also when you were reading her. I think she is, um, I don't know her, about her poetry in general, but I thought that poem captured something of the classroom teacher trying to influence a teenager who was refusing to be influenced. And yeah, I just thought it was quite a nice, uh, you know, maybe not a, maybe not the best in the world, but I thought it was quite a good poem. Anyway, something to be discussed. Um, and I think that, you know, I really would invite people to um, uh, make comments really very much in the spirit of the way Joe has, you know, share your passions, um, talk about poetry and the poetry you love and why you love it. And also maybe also talk about the kind of broader issues around poetry that kind of mean that, um, you know, it's not, doesn't play as big a role in our lives as it perhaps should do. I have to say, actually having just sort of, you know, Joe, I think that I almost feel like as you were speaking, I started to think I've got to make a New Year's resolution, slightly late, about reading a poem a day, because mm. actually those poems are just uh, marvellous. They're just mm. marvellous. So thank you. Right. So in order to participate in this discussion, um, you need to raise your start by raising your hands. Um, you have two methods. I think you have two methods of doing this. One is if you um, look along the bottom row of your, and I'm speaking from the point of view of having a computer rather than an iPad or anything else, but if you look along the bottom row or somewhere on your screen, there's a button that says reactions. And if you click on reactions, you can, um, there should be at the bottom of that little window that pops up is a, um, a raise hand sign. And I think you can also, if you click on participants, a column comes up about everybody who's in the, the room. And if you look at the bottom of that column, there's a raise hand option. So um, please do raise your hands. I'm going to call people in turn. And nicely, I've got um, somebody, Gareth, who's already got something to say there, so that's fantastic. Joe, thank you so much. I could listen to you talk about poetry all night. In fact, I have listened to you talk about <laughs> poetry um, all night. Fantastic. Um, I wondered if you could say anything about uh, lang a bit more about language and poetry. I'm, I'm interested in how uniquely, nothing else does this, poetry through metaphor, the use of metaphor enables us to sort of think in a completely different way. You know, it's, it's an entirely sort of, it's not a propositional form of knowledge. It, 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 so often a metaphor grabs two things that just don't belong together, puts them together, and somehow that resonates with us in, in, a, in not a discursive way. It's just something we catch. Um, that's how I see it. I wonder if you see it like that too, and, and whether um, you think, you know, that poetry is doing something that nothing else, not even music, can quite get to. I've had the good fortune to... Um to get your book after Wendy recommended it to me. And I've uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. And I, I actually had another look at it today before obviously your talk. And I thought the, I, I would say something about the poems and about some of the poets you've mentioned, but I wanted to say that the problem of poetry teaching is not just confined to schools. I'm, uh, I'm in the last throes of an English language and literature degree course through the Open University, which I've thoroughly enjoyed. And, and they do give you a good dash of poetry, but I have no confidence to tackle it. Even though tutors will take you through it, I've no confidence at all I suppose partly because of my background, I come from an entirely scientific and medical background. So I only came to literature and poetry very, very late. Um, but I've avoided 
doing the analysis of the poetry. As much as I've loved and enjoyed the poetry and I've loved the coursework on it, I have never felt confidence enough to analyze it. I suppose partly because of a lack of real background in literature and poetry, that might be one of the problems I face. But I, would, I just wanted to make a couple of points. I, I, I reckon that I only knew about uh, between 60 and 70% of the poets you um, talk about in your book. Mm -hmm. um, and then I don't know them very well, probably only from the most well-known poet. But I thought, I'll just have a quick look at those that I don't know anything about. And I have to tell you, they were all women, which I found quite interesting. And you, you, you actually, you mentioned one who I did know about, but I, I didn't know this poem, which is, is Christina Rossetta, um, Rossetti. But the others that I thought were, were very nice, I chose the Holly McNeish because I thought that was really interesting from such a young woman. And Edith Nesbitt, which is one of the sort of old, 1905, I think she was. But the other one, I, I, I had another look at The Gun by Vicky uh, Fever and thought to myself, oh, it's horrible. And then I was really relieved that you didn't like it at all and were highly critical of it. But the one that I, I found fascinating and would sort of recommend not just to my women friends is the one by Rita Dove mm. uh, on the Bistro Sticks. Mm. Um, that that's, was written, I think, in 1995. That, I, I thought, was an extremely sophisticated poem in many ways. And it really touched me because it's about the estrangement, really, between a mother and daughter. Mm. And it was so modern. And I couldn't quite put my finger on why it was. She's a lovely poet. Anyway, that, that, that was all I wanted to say. But thank you very much. It was very inspiring. Fine, Joe. Thank okay, you. Joe, um, you're welcome to come back and comment on either of those. Um, people, I do want to encourage people to put their hands up so we can keep the discussion going. I won't force it though. So um, if I, people I, don't have anything to say, we'll just um, move into a in, in more, more informal mode. But anyway, Joe. Happy to pick up on what Gareth was saying, because I, th I think it's absolutely, it is a fascinating thing. Uh, when Gareth was asking that question, it reminded me of something that, that, that I, a, a, an experience I frequently have. A lot of the formal work I do is kind of educational consultancy work. And I read a lot of research and nothing exasperates me more than an academic who resorts to a metaphor. And you see it again and again, you see it in commercial papers, you see it in all sorts of organizational documents. Uh, for me, metaphor is somehow, uh, it's, the, it, it's not an answer to a pragmatic question or a practical question. It's not, it doesn't have a home in science <laughs> or even in economics or in psychology or in, uh, you know, in educational research. I just find it really jarring. And I think, I suspect one of the reasons for that is, is what you're saying really, Gareth, is that I'm so used to reading literature, I'm so used to reading poetry in particular, that I'm attuned to the metaphor in a different kind of way. It, 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 it initiates my reaction. It makes me react in a different way. And I don't think it's, it's a very rational way. I think it's often an emotional thing. I think that's one of the things that distinguishes it. It often works at the level of emotion. And people often say that about music, of course, don't they? Uh, and there's a sort of, I think, but with poetry, there's often a sort of after effect, which is you have the initial kick of recognition in the metaphor and all metaphor relies on that recognition, I think most people would, would recognize that. But after that initial kick, what really great poets do is they give you so much more to think about. You can pursue a metaphor for, for, for a long time. You can, you can really interrogate it and think about it. And it makes you think, you know, it, it, it makes you do that work. Uh, so I think there is that about it. I think that's one of the things. I think there's a kind of two level, if this answers your question, Gareth, there's a kind of two level response. 
One is a very immediate, perhaps emotional response, a moment of recognition. And the second is more thoughtful and more pensive. Uh, and I think that's partly why I personally react so badly when I've been reading an academic argument about something or a, you know, a, a commercial paper or something like that. And the writer simply turns around and says, well, it's like this, you know, it's, it's compared with this. And you think, well, no, it isn't. You know, it doesn't work like that. It just doesn't work in the same sort of way. So I think that's the, that's the best way I could respond to that, I think, Gareth. Uh, on, the, on the question of the, the female poets, I was very careful in the book to try and choose some of uh, a, a decent range, you know, of male and female poets, because historically, of course, you know, the further back you go, the scarcer they become, simple as that. Uh, and so I, I really, you know, I made an effort to do that. And I do think there are some things that female poets do, do very well. Uh, and that one of the things is particularly is family. You know, I think, I think women, female poets do family much better than men. Uh, and uh, what, the only thing I'd say about Holly McNish, while I think about it actually, Wendy is, uh, I'm absolutely convinced that Holly McNish reads her poetry better than I do. Uh, and I, as I said, I find it extraordinarily difficult exercise to do uh, because of the way, because of the way performance poetry is written, really, you know, as I said in, in, the, in the talk. Okay, thank you. All right, um, we've got Shirley and then Nicholas, so Shirley. Thank you. Uh, Joe. that was really inspiring, thank you. Um, but I want you to tell me how I can fight the fear. Um, I did English literature to O-level at school many, many, many years ago and did quite a lot of poetry actually at the time. And also I did A-level English um, and you know, read T.S. Eliot and various other people and then left it all behind really. And now, um, apart from being put off with exactly what you were saying by the way that poetry is often read these days that makes it, for me, feel sort of so precious and superior really. Um, my problem is that I think, well, it's almost like I need to read about the poem before I read the poem, otherwise I won't understand what it's about. Um, <laughs> so it's, how can I turn that on its head? You know, how do you turn it on head? How do you get into reading poems and looking for meaning or just, do you just let it wash over you? I mean, you know, what's, I, I know it's no, there's no tech, no sort of quick techniques, but it's approaches, I guess I'm looking for. Yeah. Nicholas? Right, can you hear me? Yep. Right, okay. Um, I, I guess think, think, thinking about the, um, the poor teaching of poetry in schools, and you know, speaking as one who um, has probably taught poetry quite badly for a little while myself, um, I, I, I guess my question would be, what is poetry for? What's the good of it? What does it do? And I'm, I'm, I'm asking that question partly from my own experience of you know, um, writing an awful lot of adolescent poetry, very bad adolescent poetry. It was very bad because what, what I, 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 was, I, was, I was seeing poetry almost as, you know, um, you know can, it, can, it, can, it, can it function almost as a kind of magic spell? You know, this idea of Carmen, the charm, can it, can it work as a magic spell? And of course, the, 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 the the magic that I wanted it to work for me as, as, as a rather strange adolescent was that um, I, I, I was hoping that if I could write really good poetries, po poetry, this would, um, this would stop me from being such a twit. I, I, was, I, was, I was hoping that it could sort of um, function as sky hooks to pull me up. And of course, it, that, that doesn't work. So what does poetry do? Because it doesn't do that. Great. Good question. And um, uh, Rob would like to speak, and then I'll um, ask you to come back. Uh, okay. Joe. Yeah. Rob? I, I just I just wanted to ask, ask about this this idea of learning by doing, and that the, the the value of trying to write your own poetry first, and maybe have somebody criticise it or something, just to kind of learn the mechanics of it, so that when you're reading somebody else's poetry, you can understand what they've done, or is that just 
a, a sort of a, a bit of a waste of time that actually you, had, you should start with understand you know analyzing the poems that you know the, the best of the best sort of thing if you like before you you uh, attempt to put pen to paper yourself I wonder what your thoughts are on that okay right so trying to keep the three questions in this small head so I'd say surely that uh, I think the best thing to do is actually you know bite the bullet and and it's it's buy a nice collection by someone sit quietly on your own and just enjoy them and just read them. Uh, I'd, I, I've been reading recently Rebecca Watts, not Roseanne Watt, two different poets. Uh, and I, I really like Rebecca Watts's verse. It is, and it's very accessible. Uh, she writes about the natural world. She writes about curious little oddity. She's got a lovely sense of humor. But I think it's, it, it is about just biting the bullet and, and just finding finding a recommendation maybe or and just sitting with it and just sitting quietly and and reading and and i find what i do with poets with new poets is uh i do i read maybe half a dozen poems at a time i won't read a great you know i won't read chunks and chunks if i've got an, an, a little new collection of poetry then i'll read maybe half a dozen poems and then put it aside and then and then come back but, but I often will read, if a poem catches my eye, and it is definitely, it catches your eye, I'll read it three or four times without any hesitation at all. And without any worry, I, it doesn't worry me that I read it three or four times. Three or four times, it makes me think more and that I see more and more within it. So that's, that's the way I, I'd really think about that. Just bite the bullet and find someone you might, you know, somebody recommends to you or uh, that just looks, that it, that it might appeal. On the question, I think Nick asked the question about what's poetry for? Uh, I, I did try to answer this in, in, in the book, The Point of Poetry, and I ended up with this idea, which I think what poetry is for. Poetry is where people test language to breaking point. And that's why I think it really matters, but it's important to study it. I think if you study poetry successfully, if you are, uh, if you understand how it works and you and you respond to it and you uh, 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 have covered a you know a depth of poetry as well because there is such a range. If you've reached that level of experience with it, it makes you extremely able to deal with language in all sorts of other formats. Uh, you're far less vulnerable to the way people use language in different formats. And of course they do. And in an age of social media, extraordinarily so. So I, I think, you know, that's always my, that's my really go-to argument for why poetry matters, why it's important, I think, uh, Nick, which is, it, it is, it's where great artists test the breaking point of language. They absolutely push it to its extremes, what it can and cannot do. And it, and it means that, the practical effect of that in the real world is when you see a politician or you see a researcher or you see a businessman using language poorly and badly, you are far better able to see it and see through it. That's, that's really the way I, I feel about it. Uh, and uh, third question was from Rob, which was just, can you remind me, Rob, what was that question? It was about learning through doing. Oh yeah, work. good. Now, I, I actually think it's a really interesting question, this, because I, I would say, I'd put my neck out here a bit, and I know there's some teachers who probably shoot me down, but I think one of the reasons is not enough effort goes into teaching meter, and the, not the analysis of poem, the kind of GCSE analysis of poem, which is so often about politics underneath when you look at it, uh, but, the, but the, the, the nuts and bolts of it, you know, uh, you know, teaching a child the difference between iambic pentameter and, and Alexandrine or something else, or teaching them how stress patterns work in language. There isn't enough of that. And it's not done very successfully. If you're a teacher, you've got to find clever ways of doing it because it can be really dull. You know, you've got to really, you know, if you're, if you're showing a child a line of poetry and explaining to them how the, the rhythm works, you have to find a way to do it that's that's going to engage them and capture them like anything else you know you've got to capture their imagination and get them interested in it 
But I think that is one of the things that goes wrong. There isn't enough of that. That isn't done well enough. And in fact, I would, again, sticking my neck out a bit, I, I think there are lots and lots of English teachers who think they teach poetry or teach English well, who probably never teach children anything about uh, rhythm and metre in verse. Very little. They'll, they maybe say, you know, a sonnet has 14 lines and, it, you know, and things like this, but they don't really go into the nuts and bolts of it. Uh, you know, Holly McNish is an interesting example in this case, because when you when you look at things she says in interviews and so on, uh, she's not really interested in the mechanics of poetry. She says it herself, she openly says it herself. She's, she's not interested in the mechanics of verse. She's interested in the politics and the ideas. Uh, and I think, you know, that that shows. I think that's one of the things you see. Mm. Okay, um, so uh, yes, I want to encourage people to put up their hands. Like, there's some very interesting points that are being raised. I don't feel you like to have make you have to make any um, long points or anything like that. Um, and if you just want to quote a piece of poetry, that's also fine. Um, I have a, a couple of questions. I mean, on that Polly McNeish thing, I do wonder whether you're being a bit unfair to her um, in that she might claim to have no interest in the. Um, the way that poetry, the mechanics of poetry, but I would say that there's evidence in her writing that shows that she has got an awareness of it and that the, you know, it's quite carefully crafted. So I suppose that's kind of one challenge, but you know, uh, I'm, uh, yeah, anyway, just a thought. I've got a question about the idea of pleasure in language mm -hmm. and, um, uh, one of the things I don't, I mean, this is probably a, a big stereotype, but you know, the Irish are known for loving language. And there are some, you know, amazing ways in which, you know, Irish poets play with language and, and use language and use the rhythm of language and that sort of thing. And, and there's a sort of, um, and I wonder if, is that, uh, are the countries, I suppose the question is, are there, are there certain countries or nations that take greater pleasure in language than say, the English or the British do? And, you know, is there something uh, about the English language that um, in a way flattens out people's, or the, the way the English think about language that flattens out that kind of lyrical side of, of language and, and makes it very kind of pragmatic, a very pragmatic approach. So I don't know if there's, that's, a, that's probably a bit double aged and confused, but anyway, I've got uh, somebody here, Den Denise, um, I'm Sheldon, and uh, I was interested, uh, the second woman who kind of made a comment, and I think she raised an exceptionally important concept in um, accessibility uh, of poetry, and that is, and I wonder if, if Joe has some thoughts about, how do you um, uh, help the newbie or the, uh, I'm 70 years old and I just started studying poetry two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, how do you help that person who may be very um, right, uh, left brain oriented scientist? What's the best way to help them to move from left brain to right brain and make poetry more accessible to them? Um, yeah, so first of all, Joe, what I did here was really good. I'm sorry I only came in towards the end. So if any of what I say is <clears throat> um, had been covered, then I apologize. Um, so yeah, first of all, what I did here was <clears throat> your comments and critique in a way of this contemporary movement of the spoken word poets. Um, and it's really good because although I have an interest in poetry, I wasn't able, I have never been able to articulate it the way you did about the fact that they're imposing their own rhythm. Um, and so they're, they're not allowing the language to just have its own you know, the, the way that words would be pronounced are not, is not coming through, it is about the way the poet decides. And when I first saw it, um, then I thought, oh, that's, that's really interesting because it was different. Um, and yet, like you say, as time has gone on, it's become this kind of template way to recite poetry to the point where, um, when I was living in Singapore a few years ago, there was some, um, there are quite a few active writers groups in Singapore and they hold some poetry evenings. And I went along quite excited to hear what they had to say. And the content was 
quite interesting, but they all did this way of performing. And it, it was actually excruciating. I couldn't bring myself to go back because it, it actually prevents people being um, expressive, actually, because they're just trying to be like, oh, this is how I should be if I'm a performance poet. And um, I just, yeah, I mean, I'm interested to know what your thoughts are further on it. Like, where do we go from here? Because the ultimate uh, example of this for me was um, Amanda Gorman at the presidential inauguration, which incidentally I did find good. And I thought it was refreshing that actually her poem was well received because at least it meant that the whole world or at least the world that watched the inauguration were exposed to um, a, a poem on that day. But, um, and you know, hopefully the sort of elevated thoughts she conveyed in that. <clears throat> but on the other hand, the sort of, the way that it was um, communicated, this kind of performance poetry style is, is so cloying with me now. And um, I find it like conceptual art as well. It's in the visual arts, there's a sort of, there seems to be this certain point where something becomes popular and then everyone just aspires to be that. So it's complete conformity and lack of originality. Uh, so anything else you can say about that and how to change it would be interesting. Um, and then a completely different point about um, learning poetry at school. So, you know, my parents are pretty old. Um, when they were at school, they would learn poems by rote. And, <clears throat> you know, I think um, for many years, I've thought, oh, that's that seems very wrong and outdated because it's like saying the teacher is here to tell you how you do this. And, um, you know, just the idea of repetition. But because I teach English as foreign language, I realize now that repetition does have its place in terms of learning. And um, what you were saying about meter is really interesting because if you learn a poem by heart, then you are learning, you know, as a child, then it's not that dissimilar to, you know, when you're learning nursery rhyme, which is poetry anyway. And so um, I just wondered what you think of that idea of, uh, is there a place in education for children to be encouraged to learn poems by heart yeah. and, you know, recite them in little concerts together or some other means? Great question. Thanks. Yeah, good. Can uh, I just come back on those? Can I work back from... Let's see if other people want to put up their hands in the meantime. Yeah, can I work back from Rachel? Yep. So I, I'd say, Rachel, absolutely. first of all, rote, rote learning is coming back, actually. There are lots of teachers who are reintroduced, are, are beginning to do rote learning. And, you know, long, long overdue, enormously beneficial to memorise something, especially a complicated piece of verse. Uh, it, it is absolutely a, a really useful tool in a teacher's, you know, sort of toolbox to use. Uh, on the question, I'm really glad, you know, you you recognised exactly what I was describing. I'm really, I, that, that's really, for me, that's a, that's a, that's enough to, you know, say for me, the evening's a success because, because the, well, possibly the most difficult thing I was trying to get across was that thing, because I've really worried this thing about performance poetry. And, and if you, you know, you see it exactly as I see it. It's, it's all about, it is conformity. It's all about delivering the rhyme. And, and this, that, you know, the rhyme is a very naive part. It's just a small part of the mechanics of great poetry. But all performance poetry is, is all about the rhyme. And, and they'll do anything to the language as long as they deliver the rhyme. Uh, and, and they almost relish what they do to the words. They'll torture, you know, words to get them to the point where they've, they've engineered the rhyme. And it's something that that to me is is, is really kind of naive. Uh, I suspect it's going to die out quite soon. You you would if you weren't here earlier, Rachel. I did actually made a, a made it make a glancing reference to Amanda Gorman in the beginning of the, the conversation because it was so glaringly obvious that 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 particular event. Uh, I suspect it's going to run its course quite soon, but I don't think it will undo this funny thing where poets this thing where poets own their own poetry for reading that there's this there is this strong link that lots and lots of poets are convinced they're great readers 
and there's no reason why they should be. I mean, they could write the greatest poetry in the world. Was, what, why would that make them a great reader? You know, they're, they're, here's a recommendation for people who are interested in this. Go online and look up, there's a lovely version from a university, an English university, I think it might be Plymouth or Portsmouth. And they did a version online of the Ancient Mariner about last year, I think, or maybe even this year. Mm. And every verse is read, a couple of verses or so are read by a different reader. And the variety of the reading is phenomenal. And you've got a scientist in the Antarctic who's standing on the ice reading a verse. And you've got some famous actors. Uh, Jeremy Irons reads a verse beautifully. And there's a whole range of them. And listening to the poem and listening to all these different people read it really makes that point powerfully about the, it's a skill to read poetry. You know, it's, it's a, and it's no surprise, of course, that the people who do it best are often actors. That's their professional job. And, and I just recommend you have a look at The Ancient Mariner online. And the, I, my vote for the best reader is uh, it's Iggy Pop, the, the uh, you know, the real aging rock musician. His reading is absolutely extraordinary. His reading is just amazing. It, it, I really recommend it. Uh, now, going back to the, the question before that was the one about making things accessible, you know, if you're a scientific background. And I think, I think one of the ways to do that, if you're in that position, it's to come at it thematically. So you look at, find something that is of interest to you uh, and that poet, a particular poet has an interest in. So the obvious one is nature poetry. There are lots and lots of poets whose the bulk of their work is inspired by or related to the natural world around them. And that's all, of, often one of the easiest ones to get to grips with. You know, there are great poets like, you know, Shane Massini and Ted Hughes who have a fantastic engagement with the natural world. And I think that's, that makes them a little bit more accessible. So maybe thematically is one way to sort of solve that problem. I was just returning to this point about performance poetry, Joe, because I think it's, we, we haven't explicitly mentioned it yet, but it's, I think the trend has come from rap. Mm -hmm. I think po performance poetry as it's performed at the moment is the kind of bastard child of, of rap. It's got the same kind of rhythms at work there. Um, and I think that's be, that's to do with the culture of low expectations. I think that for, you know, for a long time now, it's been an orthodoxy that the only kind of poetry that you could possibly put in front of children that they would have any kind of response to is rap. And um, I, I mean, I'm sounding like I'm really down on rap here. I, act, I actually, you know, I'm a kind of white middle-class middle-aged man, so this is going to sound dreadful, but you know, I do actually like some rap. But it's, um, at the same time, there's some really, you know, regressive trends in that form of, of verse, I think, you know, everyone's quite aware of. Um, and what I worry about is that, you know, especially as kind of in the music curriculum, Mozart gets edged out to Stormzy, that actually the the form and the potential of what that form can do is getting narrowed um, really quite considerably. Amanda Gorman doing that poem is, I think, only going to accelerate that trend because I think that's sort of, uh, is kind of beginning to set a, a benchmark of the kind of poetry that young people might be interested in. You know, and I think it's terribly narrowing sounding quite reactionary here as opposed to my first question which was a bit more open but um, I wonder what you think about the fact that it's come from from rap music I think I think it is an, it's an obvious connection to make Gareth without any doubt it is an obvious connection to make uh, just interestingly uh, I was doing a, a speech at a, a big school in London some time ago about poetry and when I finished, I asked the lad, the, the children in the room, you know, they've got the questions. And one, one, a little lad said to me, yeah, what, what do you think of rap? And, and the only, the answer I gave is the answer I'll give you, Gareth, which is, do I look like I know anything about it? <laughs> and I really, you know, I couldn't be more honest. I couldn't think of a more honest way to answer that. And he, he took it completely, exactly the right way. He laughed completely and thought, yeah, why would you? You know, why would you? Uh, 
So I think that ha it has come from there. The only thing I'd add to that is I, I hope you're wrong about the Amanda Gorman after effect. I, but I suspect you might be right. Uh, I noticed, for example, in social, social media, an immediate blossoming of, of English teachers all saying, oh, I'm going to teach that poem tomorrow. In fact, they'd never read it. They couldn't look at it to study it and think about it. All they'd done is heard of one performance. Didn't seem to phase them. Now that to me is nonsensical. You know, you, you don't teach something unless you understand it fully and you've interrogated it and you think it has value. But that didn't seem to be a problem. But I think uh, when I spoke, you know, when I answered Rachel's question, I do think in the wider poetic world, the, the world of professional poetry, if there is such a thing these days, because most of them are on you know, someone like Rebecca Watts actually says she works in the library two days a week. That's the only way she can afford to write poetry. She writes three days a week and works too. In the world of professional poetry, I think there is, it's likely to die out. I think it is a, it's a fairly ephemeral phase and things will move on. Uh, but in the world of, in education and in schooling, Going back to that question of way schools teach poetry, I think Gareth, you might be right, and I, I, I would worry that you're right. That whole horrible thing about relevant literature for children is is a criminal thing, you know, and, it, and it's terribly common still. Uh, but you know, we'll see. I suppose. I guess we'll see. Somebody wanted to speak, Thomas. Uh, I think that's me. Oh yes. Okay. Good. Yep. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, Joe, thanks for a great talk. That was uh, that was fantastic. Um, one of the things you you mentioned, you said something very uh, illuminating. You said that poets push or poetry pushes language to its breaking point. Um, there's two things about that that I think are worth discussing. One is, does it have to to be good poetry push anything to its breaking point? Does that have to be that kind of radical or that dramatic? And the other thing is, does it is it, is it radical enough that it's language? I mean, uh, couldn't, does, does poetry only do something to language and our experience and sense of language? Uh, or couldn't it have like an ambition to, to do something to our mm, emotional lives, to actually do something to our souls, something, uh, something, something I want to say real, although language is perfectly real. I'm not, I'm not saying it's not. Um, and what your remark made me think of is a movie um, from about 15 years ago called Kiss, Kiss, Bang, Bang. Uh, Robert Downey Jr., uh, Shane, uh, Shane Black, I think was the director's name. Um, movie, they went on to make Iron Man together, Iron Man 3, I think. Uh, and there's a scene where Robert Downey Jr. is trying to pick up Michelle Monaghan in a bar. And it's not going well, but what we find out later why, because she already knows who he is. Um, and then he sort of apologizes and pulls back and says, sorry, I guess I'm interrupting. I feel badly. And she corrects him and says, <coughs> no, you feel bad. Mm -hmm. And then he says, I, he makes clear that he doesn't know what that, what she's trying to say. And she says, you feel bad. Badly is an adverb. So to say you feel badly is to say that the mechanism which allows you to feel is broken, uh, which I thought is just a beautifully uh, poetic way of, first of all, saying what's probably wrong with Robert Downey Jr.'s character at the time. Um, but secondly, to say something about what poetry might do. So poetry, the, and the way I always say it very banally when I talk to uh, students and, and anybody who will listen to me is that poetry actually makes us feel better. It, it doesn't give us better emotions. It doesn't actually make us happy when we're sad, but it makes us better able to feel the sadness we feel, better able to feel the happiness we feel, if that's what we feel, or in other words, makes us feel it more precisely. So it sort of helps us to bring precision to emotion. And I wonder if, if so to bring back to, to your point about the breaking point of language, I wonder if maybe that's saying exactly the same thing. Maybe you have to bring language to its breaking point to bring precision to emotion. Maybe that's exactly where the two meet. Uh, but I guess I'm just wondering what you think of my theory 
I, I, I understand exactly what you're saying, and I think it's that's that the closest thing I think think about that when when you were describing that is is what the Russian formalists would have said, which is, and I have an awful lot of sympathy with that, and and ever since I read it, you know, read sort of Todorov and people like that years ago, that made an awful lot of sense to me. Uh, you know, good art, it's not just poetry, but, you know, good writing, good literature sends you back into the world, better attuned to it. You know, you go back into the real world, better able to feel, like, and literally that, better able to respond to the real world. I mean, I uh, can't remember now, who is it? I've forgotten my, you know, my literary theory days are long gone in many ways. Uh, Shlovsky, I think, said, Art exists so that stones may be made stony. Uh, and, you know, that's the idea that a, a, a poet can write a great verse about, you know, a lump of grey rock. But when you see that lump of grey rock next time, you actually have a much better grasp of what a lump of grey rock is because of the work that he did with the language. And, and I have a lot of sympathy with that. You know, I really have. A, and, and, you know, you extrapolate from that to human interaction and feelings and relationships. And, you know, that, that makes a lot of sense. And of course, the example you gave from the film, she is exactly right when she says, you know, that's an adverb, that is exactly right. And, and when you study poetry, you are not gonna make mistakes like that. That's, you know, that's, that's the fact. You will never make a mistake like that. Uh, you, you also reminded me of something, sending back to a question Shirley raised earlier when Shirley was saying about accessibility. Uh, it, you have to find you have to find a poet somewhere on a scale between Blake, maybe early Blake, and Gerard Manley Hopkins. You know, Hopkins pushes language way beyond what most people can tolerate, really, and and you have to work at it to understand what he's doing. Whereas someone like you know Blake early on is much much more kind of accessible at the level of uh, of grammar and at the level of language. Uh, but I, but you know, I, I, I absolutely agree that, that with when I said in my book I, I attempted to you know find an answer and that uh, I ca in the end came down on the idea that it's about testing language to breaking point. That doesn't preclude other things that poetry does, of course. And you know, when you're Milton, you use poetry to you know dis describe man's relationship with God. Why wouldn't you? <laughs> uh, you know, that's the level of, there's no limits to the ambition of a, of a great poet. They will, they will use it to, to deal with what they want, you know, what they think they can manage. And, and someone like Milton's ego has no boundaries, really. Okay, yeah, that was um, really a good uh, question and answer. Um, so I think we're kind of getting to the point where I'm gonna uh, wrap up the formal part of the meeting and um, give our thanks to Joe. And then I'll leave the uh, meeting open for a bit so people can kind of jump in more informally and ask any kind of little questions. There's quite a lot of points in the chat which suggest that people, I mean, people have been really engaged with this and, and really enjoyed it, Joe. And it's a sort of, um, I think people have really learned a lot. I mean, certainly, my own um, thinking about, you know, I think between you, you and Rachel, you sorted me out on the poor on uh, Holly McNeish, I guess. I suppose one only other question relating to that is that somebody posted something on um, Under Milk Wood coming to the National Theatre. And Under Milk Wood is essentially a performed poem. It's a kind of play poem. And obviously Shakespeare is performed poetry. So I suppose what your probably saying is that it's, uh, I mean, the thing, point that you were stressing about is that kind of the forcedness of performance pro poetry rather than the way that um, poets like Shakespeare or Dylan Thomas just sort of weave a story through poetry, weave a narrative through poetry in a way that um, brings your mind in in so many different sort of layers, I suppose, and that thing about you, you, you read poetry once like you Gerald Manley Hopkins you know incomprehensible the first time you read maybe slightly more the second maybe by the time you've read it 10 times you're sort of um almost magicked by him into a sort of a being bewitched just by the language of it so it's sort of maybe that's that's the process but I I think what you 
been saying is is really fascinating it's given a lot of food for thought so do you want to say any final words um joe before we wrap up and give you your deserved round of applause and then um just you know open it up to a slightly more relaxed engagement for people who want to stick around yeah, very, just very very briefly wendy well certainly thank you very much you know for nice comments from people it's, it's really pleasant to be appreciated for for trying to deal with what is i think a difficult thing still as you know we, we agree is a difficult thing uh, on the performance thing, Wendy, I think it's a simple, the simple way of thinking about this. Uh, the thing about, and the thing I love about Shakespeare, of course, is what lots of critics say about Shakespeare is he's absent from his work. You will not meet a performance poet today who wants to be absent from their work. <laughs> that's the best way to think about it, I think. So that was, that's a nice rounding off point. Okay, good and very succinct. All right, so can everybody unmute themselves and give uh, Joe a round of applause? Thank you very much. That was